I recently saw one of my favorite posts on social media ever this week, the wonderful Becky Smith. Now, the reason I love this social media post, which went on Instagram and on LinkedIn, is because Becky was talking about PowerPoints. And you all know that I love PowerPoints. And she said that she was sat watching one recently, and she noticed that the branding across the PowerPoint slides was very consistent, which weirdly is like an odd thing to notice. And she said, as a result of seeing this PowerPoint so well branded throughout, I was filled with confidence that I could trust this brand, that they would be consistent, not only in the services that they offered, but the advice that they would give. I felt like I was in safe hands. And I was like, amen, Becky Smith. That is a great point to make. I was liking it as much as I could. I was a huge fan. As a man who appreciates branding and literally runs a business that deals with it, I couldn't have agreed with this sentiment anymore, that PowerPoints are very, very important. In fact, as somebody once famously said, with great PowerPoints comes great responsibility. And I really, really do believe this. In fact, did you know that the community church even has its own set of PowerPoint guidelines? Right, yet Sally knows, Sally knows. The community church even has a broader, wider set of brand guidelines, colors, fonts, styles. Who would have the time to put something like that together? I, literally, I don't know. But the thing is, brand consistency is very, very important. And as someone who is employed to do this, uh, I, I know, and it's true. And what we do is we, we create these documents and we call them brand guidelines. And the reason that we do it is because we might spend months working with a brand to figure out their identity. What is the brand? Who are they? What are they about? What do they stand for? Why do they exist? Who are they trying to reach? To what end? We spend months doing all of this hard work and we might come out of that process with a beautiful logo, fonts, colors, this great set of assets for them to use. And then we release them into the wild and they turn feral, and they just forget absolutely everything that we've talked to them about. And one of the most famous examples you may have seen online is this. Please keep the door closed, thank you, written in Comic Sans with exclamation points, and then the follow-up from the manager, I assume, says, please don't use Comic Sans, we are a Fortune 500 company, not a lemonade stand. One of the all-time great uh, to's and fro's in the workplace. So next time you see someone using that, you can use this as well. Uh, a bit of free ammunition for you there. But the reason we go on about brand guidelines is for this reason. They help the brand to behave in a certain way out in the wild. It's different from the workshops when you've got all the team together and you're having a little team huddle and you, yes, this is what we're about. This is what we can do. You need a set of instructions to help you learn how to speak, how to conduct yourself, what to look like, all of these things. And without that, it can all fall apart. And that is why I begin to shudder when I see PowerPoint slides that look a little bit like this. And there is just, there's clip art and different fonts and it's all distorted. I can lose my mind. And, but that's why I care so much about it. In a way, Paul is ending his letter to the Thessalonians by saying, Mikey's like, literally, how are you gonna link this together? I am going to, I promise. He has spent four, four and a half chapters looking at the identity of this church, of this community of believers. Literally, the titles for the talks over the last few weeks have been some of the things that I do in workshops. What do you exist for? What are you waiting for? How are you going to get there? What are you all about? These are the big questions that we like to ask. But now comes the crucial moment. We've spent all this time talking about your DNA, what you're for, why you exist. But how are you going to do it? That's the big question. And so, in come the brand guidelines. And I would suggest that the remaining section, chapter five, that we're about to read, there are three main things that Paul tells us to do. He says that you need to love your leaders, you need to fight for your family, and you should worship in wonder. So let's go through these. I know, I'll just sit down there. Well, that's, I'm done. Okay, so everyone uh, repeat this after me, please. Love your, leaders. Love your leaders. Thank you very much. There are two ingredients for successful leadership, and we're literally going to be working through this verse by verse. So take, take a look here. We're just right at the beginning in verses 12 and 13. Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. 
hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Now, although leaders are asked to do three things, that, that the word used for hard work is kind of like a physical toil. It's, it can be used for farmers, people that work with their hands. It's a, it's a blood, sweat, and tears sort of hard work. We've got care, which means loving for those, and also admonishing, so instructing, keeping them on the straight and narrow. And I think you'll all agree that Dave and Marion and some of the other leaders here do an excellent job of doing all of those three things. But the thing that's really interesting about this section is that we are encouraged not just to sit under and receive from wonderful leaders, but we are to do something for them, to hold them in the highest regard in love. This is a compound statement, and it means it's combining lots of different ideas. To hold someone in a high regard, but equally to love them deeply. And actually, I strongly believe that the love-lead cycle pushes one another around. And really, for people in leadership in a church context to thrive, what do they need? Love from us. And actually, when they lead well, we love them more, and then that encourages them to continue leading well. Do you see what I'm doing? So actually, both of these things fuel one another. And it's not just for Dave and Marion and others on the leadership team. Actually, we're talking about uh, we can broaden this out. There are so many people that are involved in this community that exercise leadership and influence. The people that lead our midweek small groups, children's groups, the tech team who are doing an amazing job at the moment with this ridiculous setup. Everyone that's contributing to making Sundays and our church life throughout the week happen, they are exercising leadership and we need to love them. Because actually, when the love bit falls out and it becomes a thankless task, then the leading becomes difficult. And so then that stuff starts to fall apart. And what happens? Well, there's a lot less love. And so it can become this dangerous cycle. So church, this morning, if there's one main thing that I want you to do more of, it's to find people who are actively leading and being a good influence in your life and to show them love. And that could be anything, whatever your love language is, I don't know. Uh, for me, it's going off and I'll, I'll drop beers at someone's house or, or make them a meal or just send them a text message. Whatever is easy for you, find a way to love the people who are helping lead you in your life. That is the first thing that this letter is asking us to do. Okay, step number two. I want you to say this as well, please. Fight for your family. Fight for your family. Thank you very much. We are given a threefold ministry, and let's uh, read it together here. So, just going on from where we were, so starting in verse uh, 14. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, to, to do what? We've got three things here to warn those who are idle and disruptive, to encourage the disheartened, and to help the weak. You could include be patient with everyone, but everyone's a bit of a harder thing to work with. So, we're going to stick with those three. So, we've got these three jobs. Warn the idle, encourage the disheartened, and help the weak. And you might say to me, well, Matt, we've just been talking about leaders. It's the leader's job. Yay, that's why we pay someone, because they can do it for us. Wrong. That is not how life works. Yes, in a lot of places, it is expected that actually the person at the top of the food chain in the local church context is expected to deliver all of these three things literally for everyone. And that is the quickest way to burn out and destroy leaders. So actually, what the Bible suggests is a group effort. Yes, people like Dave and Marion and others are pastorally kind of at the top and they will oversee and support others. But the leader's job, and I love this quote, is to multiply ministry, not to monopolize it. So it is not the job for a leader to hold on to the reins of looking after people, doing it all, constantly giving up everything to make sure that every single person is looked after. It's impossible. This is a joint effort. We have to fight for the family of this church. Thank you, Graham. And the way that we do that, I would like to suggest, is by being administers of three things. And they tie up quite neatly here to the three people groups that we're trying to meet. And just before we do this, you'll also notice 
that um, I think that we all fall into these categories. I think that these, you know, we're all responsible for helping, but also at some point in your life, you will find yourself in one of these three groups of people, maybe all three at the same time when it's going really bad. And that is fine. That means you are normal and you are especially welcome here this morning. Church is not for the perfect. We're all trying to figure it out. What do we do? To the idol, we give faith. To the disheartened, we give hope. And to the weak, we give love. Okay, so why do I suggest that? Well, if you look uh, at this first phrase, the idol and the disruptive. If you were to read this, I don't know if anyone still has a new King James version of the Bible or has ever dipped into it. Maybe when you're on your Bible app and you can just kind of check the different translations, you might just dabble in a little bit of old English just because it's quite fun. That's a very nerdy thing to say. Sorry, I've given that away. The NKJV has a wonderful expression here for idle and disruptive. It is, he who walketh disorderly. I absolutely love that. I want that on a t-shirt. Someone who walketh disorderly. That also sounds like a kind of a late Friday, Saturday night thing. Driving down Park Street, you'd say, they walketh disorderly. And I'm not sure where else you would use this context, but for me, I think that's absolutely brilliant. The reason it uses that is not because they're under the influence, but it's because the original Greek is a military term for a soldier acting out of rank or, or literally leaving the, the single file line. It's someone who goes off course and disobeys orders. And so really, for someone who walketh disorderly, what we're talking about is someone who acts in a way that is not appropriate for the community where they belong. And who here has ever felt like they've acted out of accordance with the community where they belong? Yes, that should be every single hand. At some point in your life, you will do something, say something, think something, and you'll go, I really hope that nobody at church figures that one out or that I did that because I will get kicked out. I'll be excommunicated. That's, again, that's a normal experience. It happens. It's okay. We all fall into this category every now and again. But the reason why we need to give faith is because in James 2 verse 18, it says this, I will show you my faith by my deeds. The Bible makes it really clear that actually the deeper you go in faith, your behavior does change. You will actually find that things that you think about, the things that you say, the way that you treat people, it should change. We have a little phrase that we say, which is come as you are, but don't leave the same, right? And I believe that for church. Actually, everyone is welcome. We're all here together. We're all a bit of a mess sometimes. We're figuring it out. But we believe that Jesus can change your whole life. And actually, it's not just about acceptance. It is about discipleship and growth and change. And we do believe that with faith comes a change in your uh, whole person. So we want faith for the idle and the disruptive. We want hope for the disheartened. And the reason for that is because these are the people among us who have suffered loss and they need comfort and they need us to quite literally hold them up. As we suffer, we are actually equipped to suffer, uh, to suffer and help with those who are suffering too. You can actually read about this in 2 Corinthians uh, at the very beginning of it, and I think Esther mentioned it a few weeks ago in one of her talks, this idea that as we receive comfort from God, we are then equipped to comfort others who are going through something. And actually, church community thrives when its members support one another in times of need. And I can stand here today and say that actually, you know, with myself individually, but me and Maddie, as well as a family with Oz, we are so, so grateful for the res the res the support we receive from the community church, both from individuals, but corporately as a family, it means the world to us. And in our small groups, prayer groups, the whole lot, we are so, so grateful for the support that we get on a weekly basis. And actually church exists in one way to support those who are bereaved, those who are going through illness, those who have lost work, those who are finding parenting an absolute nightmare, the whole thing, the whole scale of difficulty, we exist to hold you up not to give you answers, not to make you feel better, but to stand with you and say, I've been there too, and we'll go through this together. We are to give hope to the weak. And finally, love, sorry, hope for the disheartened and love for the weak. Now again, interestingly, the Greek word here for weak actually carries um, a tone of sexual immorality, which is a very lovely phrase, isn't it? It's used very early on a Sunday morning, sexual immorality. Feels a bit weird saying it. 
But the reason that love is a key ingredient here is for the following reason. Now, we don't know exactly why Paul chose to highlight this, but it's interesting that he did. He's chosen three categories of people, those who act out of line, those who are discouraged, and those who are maybe tempted sexually to do things that they shouldn't. Or people that have certain thoughts, certain actions, they behave in a certain way. We need to support and love them. Now, as a side note, we've just finished Pride Week, and actually I've been really discouraged at some things I've been hearing Christians say about Pride and about Pride Month, and I'm not going to give a big commentary on that here, but actually, if you were to be a Christian and slander, uh, excommunicate, make uncomfortable, unwelcome, or unlove someone from that community, I actually think you're going against the words of Jesus to be someone who loves radically first. And I just wanted to say that because I've heard some stuff that I, I think is really discouraging, um, and I think that we need to love first. And I'm really upset when that doesn't happen. But actually, for, for this particular passage, Paul says, love should be given at all times to all people because inside the Christian community is the ability for friendships and communion with one another that will hold us all through the, the many temptations that will come through life. Whether you are happily or unhappily married, single, elderly, young, wherever you are in your stage of life, relationships are never easy, regardless of your orientation, what you think about, where you're at in life. It's never easy. There are always temptations. And I think that sometimes as church, we glorify and only talk about very stereotypical marriages, and we exclude everyone else from the services that we, that we offer, the things that we talk about, uh, and I think that we could do more to show love and support to people wherever their stage of life. Amen. <laughs> and as I said, the church is not responsible for providing you with a group of friends. I think that's sometimes a, a misconception. If I go to church, I should automatically just be given like five or six very good friends. Sadly, it doesn't quite work that way. They take years to, to make and manufacture and lots of hard work. But what I do believe is that Paul is really encouraging here that in the way that the church is set up, the way that the church members look after and care for one another, the opportunity for friendships should be there through small groups, through prayer triplets, through social events. I've loved that we've been able to start doing meals together again. All of that good stuff. There should be opportunities here for people to feel love because that is the greatest weapon against all kinds of sexual temptation and immorality and other things that you may get led down the line with. Good friendships, good family, church community is the greatest weapon that we have against all of that, and the devil hates it. So if you ever feel isolated, excluded, you're letting him have a foothold in your life, don't stop coming to church. Don't stop going to your home group. Don't stop praying with that small group of friends. Keep it up. Keep working. He doesn't want you uh, to, to do that stuff because he knows if he can isolate you, get you outside the group, that's when he can trick you and start feeding you lies. You need to hang in there. And actually, brothers and sisters, if we see people that we feel like they're falling away, they're not getting involved as much, this is a warning to us. We need to bring them back into the fold. It's not just about Sunday mornings, but just going for a coffee or phoning them. We have to be on the lookout for people who are getting isolated from our tribe. Finally, in this section, verse 15, striving to do good. I love this phrase. And actually, it's so much more than just being a do-gooder. I hate that phrase, being a do-gooder. But actually, to strive to do good, again, the original wording here, it carries something of a sense of force, uh, something you have to actively fight for in the face of extreme opposition. And that is why I'm choosing the language, fight for family, because this does not come easily. We have to fight for it. And then lastly, worship with wonder. Repeat this after me, please. Worship with wonder. Now, we get to the part of the letter where there really is a quick-fire list. I don't want to spend too long here, but let's just quickly see what we've got. I've always also thought this is interesting because they always say, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? And people always say, oh, well, it's Jesus wept. But actually, we've got two other two-word verses here, which always surprises me. I don't know who decides when the verses happen, but we've got some very, very short verses. Look at this in verse 16. Rejoice always, verse 17. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to speak about prophecy. 
holy kisses and uh, distributing God's word. And I don't know about you, but, oh, great, okay, so the graphic's not worked here. That's meant to be a lovely pie chart that shows six equal sections, but you can just use your imagination. I know, I know, I've let you down. The whole thing's a failure. You can just picture there are six equal sections. And I think that these are are six fairly decent ingredients, right, for when church meets together, that we should be striving for these things. I love that we've opened with songs about praise because I just think that's a wonderful thing to start with, to rejoice always. It's not an instruction to fake it and to be happy, but it's an invitation to worship and to put God back where he belongs at the center. An instruction to pray continually, to give thanks always. I love so much that Tim Dobson, one of his legacies in my life when I had the pleasure of working with him here at the community church was that every meeting, regardless of what it was, started with thanks. What are you grateful for? What, what's happened recently that we can celebrate? And that's something that continues to live long in the memory. To, people who, to be people who actively prophesy, I'm so grateful that in this church family, there are groups that meet before the church service and they pray and they say, God, what are you saying to us today as a group? Prayer needs to be at the forefront of what we're doing, but also actively listening for what God is saying to us. And then just really quickly, I wanted to wrap up by mentioning this, this last bit here. Uh, love and the word. Now, uh, take a look at this just in verses 25 to 27. I really like this. Uh, Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all of God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. Now, as I was studying this and and reading a couple of books about it, uh, one person pointed out that this really, really, really strikes such a strong resemblance to that very famous description of the early church in Acts. And actually, the the encouragement for a holy kiss and distributing the word are two things that the Christian community was famous for uh, in its earliest days, and we need to try and recapture some of this. And what I don't mean is walking around uh, and invading people's personal space by doing wet, sloppy kisses on their cheeks. I'm not talking about that. That might be a cultural expression, but the way we would translate that today is what does a sweet intimate family life look like in the 21st century for the modern day church and we need to start moving towards that and then also focusing on God's written word finding ways to share it to speak it with our friends and our family and our colleagues to focus on it on Sundays and during the week how can we make more of the word of God because if we can do that then we can recapture something of that early church Uh, And you can read about this in Acts chapter 2, and it says this in verse 42, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together together. Uh, with glad and sincere hearts. That's the best way to eat food. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And what was the result of this rich family life? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If the church can become more of a family and not a cult, uh, more of a community of believers who, who passionately love the world and want to make a difference instead of a group of insiders that just sling insults at the rest of the world and just hate everything else and don't in- involve themselves at all. If we can become known for love and welcoming and acceptance, the Lord will add to our number, hopefully daily. And then I wanted to finish with this encouragement. Because at the end of all of this, you might think, well, flip an act, Matt, that's great. You've just added about 25 things to my to-do list. I'm already busy. What are you doing? I have so much to do this week, and now I've got all of this. Well, I think Paul sort of preempted that, as every good preacher does. And he says this. May God himself, in verse 23, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at this, verse 24. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. After all of these instructions about things we can try to do, strive to do, give it our absolute best, even when we're running on 1%, he says, God is faithful. He will do it. And this so perfectly demonstrates something that Paul loves to do, which is to say, you guys have to do some work, 
But God is going to be the one that energizes you to do it. And we have to keep this in balance because so often you'll hear one sermon that says, do this, do this, do this, and you are exhausted just by the end. And then you hear some sermons that say, God is going to do this, God is going to do this, and then we get really comfortable and relaxed. Oh, God is just going to sort this out. I don't need to do a thing. That's neither of those are a biblical approach. Paul says, you have to work, you have to try hard, you have to fight for your family, love your leaders, and worship when you don't feel like it. And when you are running on empty because you've been working so hard, put some batteries in you. God is faithful. He will do it. He can inspire you to wake up in the morning and to praise even when it is all going wrong. God can give you energy to love your neighbor when they have been bad-mouthing you and accusing you. God can help you love your leaders when you disagree with them and when things aren't going well and the rotor falls apart, heaven forbid. And we can still, by God's grace, Love our leaders and our team, and we can work at this together. God is faithful. He will do it. Churches mess up. Leaders mess up. I know you don't think it. We all look perfect, but we do. We mess up. Your team, we're going to mess up. The people that you work with are going to mess up. But God is faithful. He will do it. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray for us. Oh, Father God, we, um, yeah, we, Lord, we just get to the end of this series and we get to the end of this chapter and we're just so grateful for the words that you've given Paul to encourage the early church. And Lord, as he's in a way given us this set of brand guidelines, Lord, he said, okay, this is who you are, the people of God, children of light. Here is how you work it out. Lord, I just pray that this morning you would encourage each of us to be people who love our leaders really well. Lord, that you would give us the the foresight and the wisdom to know how we can fight for our family, both inside and outside this church building. Oh, and Lord, we just pray that we would become a worshipping community. Lord, that we would fall in love with you again. And actually, our songs would be so much more than just going through the motions, but actually would connect with something deeper within us, Lord, as we look to you, that you would inspire us. God, I pray that we would worship throughout the week, uh, whether we're at work, whether we're at home with family, whether we're on our own. God, help us to be people who worship you, who look to you, who give you thanks. God, I pray that you would do that in our midst. Oh Lord, as we get ready now to to take communion, and again, we reenact this family thing of sharing a meal. Lord, I pray that you would help us to focus on you and hear your words to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.